an HVAC technician won't always know when the problem that they're really up against is that that finished room over the garage is super air leaky and it doesn't matter how much air they supply to it, they're not gonna keep it comfortable. Marrying the building science together with the HVAC performance helps people solve these problem homes and find out what, what's really going on. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast, a regular discussion with building industry professionals. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Steve Rogers of the Energy Conservatory. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast and the original Fine Home Building Podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can leave feedback and ask questions there too. Steve, it's so good to see you again. Thanks so much for being on the show. Yeah, great to be here, Patrick. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so I'm familiar with what you do, but you, can you please tell listeners about their company's products and uh, what, uh, how long it's been around and maybe a little history would be great. Yeah. So I'm the president of the Energy Conservatory, one of just a couple of uh, manufacturers of blower doors and other air tightness uh, measurement equipment that's used for basically quality assurance in um, building uh, homes and even larger buildings as well. So um, the blower we so we make the blower doors for measuring air tightness of buildings we also make a product called the duct blaster which is a similar uh, device but smaller for measuring how airtight duct work is um, as you may know in the southern part of the country duct work is often outside of the conditioned space and therefore uh, when you're leaking out of the duct work into your attic or into your crawl space that's a big problem for both comfort and for energy efficiency uh, and then we also make uh, a device called the, the True Flow, which is used for measuring airflow through the furnace or air handler in an HVAC system. And we make um, manometers as well that are used in conjunction with those other instruments. Um, go ahead. I, I think it's fair to say that the company was founded by uh, enthusiasts, people who are really trying to do good work. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. The company was founded by Gary Nelson in the early 1980s. Uh, Gary had worked at the uh, energy office for the state of Minnesota, and uh, through his the research that he was doing on energy use of buildings back then, um, he became aware of blower doors and how testing was done. And at the time, a blower door uh, was a device that cost tens of thousands of dollars, even back in the 80s. Um, and to do a test took you know half a day or all day um, to do. And uh, Gary understood sort of the principles and uh, decided, you know, there's got to be a way to make this much easier uh, to do this test because it's important for not only uh, energy, but also for comfort and performance and durability of the building materials to not have air leak through the, the building shell. And so he uh, did some consulting at first and then went out on his own and said, you know, I think I can make one of these a lot cheaper. And he made a prototype and it didn't work at all. Then he made another prototype and it worked reasonably well. And by the third prototype, he had something that worked really pretty well. And of course, it's just evolved over time from there. And then, you know, a friend wanted one and could he make five of them for this uh, organization that was doing some testing and it just, uh, you know, snowballed from there to where we are today. Um, we'll talk more about it in a little bit, but I think the real brilliance is the manometer. Did he come up with that concept of the two-channel two manometer to, to do this air tightness testing at the time? Um, you know, I'm not sure where two channels came from. Uh, the other thing that's special about the manometers we make is the auto zero valve. So in, in order to measure how airtight a building is, you have to have a manometer that can measure very small pressures very accurately. And the only way to do that is to put basically a valve inside that applies zero pressure every 10 seconds and then the sensor re-zeroes itself. Um, but that even that technology is not invented by the Energy Conservatory. That's been around since before um, you know, we made manometers, um, but it was you know, even more niche back then. So I'm actually not sure where the, the two-channel idea uh, came from, but uh, you know, auto-zeroing, basically Gary put existing technology together and said, you know, this is what we need to make. Um, let's build the calculations that are required right into the manometer, uh, and then, then it became well. Like, can we do uh, blue, or you know Wi-Fi communication, and then Bluetooth, and touch screens, and you know it's basically just following a, a particular measurement that started with a magnahelic gauge, if you know what those look like. Uh, <laughs> uh, magne uh, 
HVAC technicians, older ones, will know what a magnahelic gauge is. And it's a basically a, a big dial pressure manometer that's useful for measuring very small pressures. And blower doors initially didn't have their own digital manometers. It was basically these magnahelic gauges that were used to measure the pressures. Um, and it's evolved from there to where it's all purpose-built and you know much simpler to do the test. And that's been the evolution over the decades has just been making it easier and easier to be able to do these measurements because they're so important for building performance, for comfort, and for energy. So uh, I think you'd agree. This is a pretty niche business. How did you come to be involved at the Energy Conservatory and then by the company? So um, I have worked most of my career. I worked for 19 years uh, for a company called Emerson. It's the, the same one that does HVAC controls and so forth, um, but in a different division that did instruments for industrial process control. And my expertise was um, measuring flow and measuring pressure um, and sometimes uh, level and temperature. But um, these were for industrial applications, am I right? Like, what were some of the yes. things you were you were yeah so measuring? So uh, <laughs> uh, flow meters was a thing, and I spent most of my time in design working on electromagnetic flow meters, which are used to measure any liquid that's conductive. So water, wastewater, you can measure the flow of paper pulp in a paper mill with an electromagnetic flow meter. Um, and so that was my experience. And um, uh, Dwyer Instruments, who does HVAC controls, decided they wanted to develop an electromagnetic flow meter. And so they had hired a recruiter who did some patent searching and found my name on some patents and reached out to try and contact me to see if I could help Dwyer develop an electromagnetic flow meter. And um, so that turned out to be a great opportunity for me. And so I picked up the family and, and moved to Indiana. And we still had, you know, three kids in high school. And it turned out to be a really uh, great career opportunity. I really liked the job working with and working with that company. And my high school age kids totally fell apart when we moved to Indiana from Minneapolis. And so um, we started scratching our heads and figuring out, you know, how do we get the kids back to a better um you know, support system and uh, situation, reconnecting with friends and stuff. And Dwyer was very understanding. We moved back to Minneapolis and I, I worked for Dwyer temporarily while I was look, searching for a new job. And it was that job search that led me to the Energy Conservatory. They were looking for an engineering and operations manager. And um, I was a good fit for that. And then after about a year working as the engineering and operations manager, you know, it, I found out that Gary was looking for a successor. And the most important thing in a successor to Gary was finding somebody that would continue the mission of the company that he had started, which is really to save energy, to improve the performance of buildings, to make people more comfortable and so forth. And I was very much in line with that mission. Um, Gary liked the skills that he saw in me. And so um, I bought the company from Gary in 2017. And uh, but Gary remains active. He didn't retire like a lot of people think. Oh, I sold the company. He must have retired. But he's still very active. Attends a lot of conferences, and is uh, working with us every week on you know new products and uh, company direction and everything else. So, did you have any knowledge of blower doors and the kind of products you make before uh, starting work there? No, uh, almost none. I had I had seen the name of the company one time when I worked at Dwyer. Um, and I had worked through a recruiter just looking for, you know, something in Minneapolis when we need, decided we needed to move back to Minneapolis. And, uh, after a couple months, a couple months after having met with a recruiter, she called me back and she said, there's this little company in Minneapolis. And I think what they do is related to your experience. You should go talk to them. And so we set up the interview and the first person I met was Gary and within 10 minutes, Gary took me up to the flow measurement chamber and explained how they're using an orifice plate as the reference flow measurement and what kind of a flow conditioner they're using in the chamber that's used to calibrate blower doors. And um, I just had this overwhelming sense of, you know, these are my people. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it was just such an outstanding fit. I, I really thought I was going to end up doing something completely unrelated to my previous 20 years of experience. But no, this is right exactly up my alley. It's the same kind of technology and it's the same kind of measurements, but for a completely different purpose. So building science was very new to me. HVAC was quite new to me. Uh, but measuring 
air pressure and measuring flow was very familiar to me. So uh, your neighbors and other folks that you know in, in Minneapolis, are they aware of the company? Do they have any knowledge of the uh, groundbreaking work that was done there to start measuring the air tightness of houses and ductwork? Um, almost none of them do. Um, you know, it's the, the company's not very big. We're 25 people. Uh, it's, uh, and so the people that know who we are are people that are doing blower door tests and know that we're in town and they can drop off their gauge to get it calibrated rather than, ma- rather than mailing it in. <laughs> or, uh, you know, the weatherization people in, in the community, the people that are doing um, you know, energy ratings for new construction. So people in the building science industry know who we are, but almost nobody else does. So uh, you were alluding to it earlier. The, the manometers you make, and I think most people who have used one would agree, or uh, have used one would agree with me. Uh, they're well designed and easy to use. Um, how does one go about designing such a complicated thing? How do you even know where to start? Well, where you start is is what you've used before. So the first digital manometer we made was, you know, like one step removed from somebody else's um, analog you know, mechanical manometer. And then the next version after that, we said, you know, if we put two sensors in there, then we won't have to switch back and forth between one sensor and the other sensor. So it used to to be the um, DG3, one of the first digital manometers, there were, there was only one sensor and then there was a valve to switch back and forth between the building pressure and the fan pressure, which would tell you the flow. Um, And so then the next version was, well, let's put two sensors in it let's put a keypad on there so we can actually choose which ring is on the blower door. And then we can automatically have the manometer calculate the flow. So it's very much an evolution. Um, But I would say that the, the move from DG 700, which everybody knows and loves, like, you know, Linus loves his blanket in the peanuts cartoons. (laughs) Um, The change from that product to the DG 1000, um, was a little more purposeful. Um, at that point, we partnered with a design firm and said, we want something, we want to move in the direction of having more of a design language, having a better look. Uh, we want it to be more ergonomic and we want to be thinking more purposefully about how people are doing the tests. And so that led to you know, a, a capacitive touchscreen and to uh, you know, Wi-Fi communication um, built in and uh, and it's kind of, I would describe it as menu driven. It's, yeah. uh, you know, it's pretty simple. If you, you know, know what you're doing, you, you just yeah. push the buttons and it helps you. Yeah. And the intent was to make it operate very much like, um, a smartphone since that's becoming ubiquitous. Everybody knows how to use one. We're trying to lower the, uh, the training, um, burden for somebody learning how to do blower door tests. And I think that's been very successful. People are able to say, oh yeah, I get it. And, and not surprisingly, it tends to be younger people pick it up quicker than people that have been doing blower door tests for, for 50 years. Right. Cause when you've done something that long, you, you get used to how you do it and it's tough to change. Yeah. Ask me how I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So my observation is that, uh, Minneapolis has always been a place where building science innovation and research happen. Uh, why do you think that is? Is it simply because it's just so cold? You know, it must be the cold. Uh, it's either the, either the cold or the you know work ethic of the Scandinavian immigrants. I'm not sure <laughs> one or the other. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think um, you know I've looked at it this way. If um, if you're building leaks when you're in Louisiana, um, you know the difference between the outdoor air and the indoor air is probably 20 or 30 degrees. But in Minneapolis, if cold air leaks in through the enclosure of your building, um, you're going to feel it because it's like 100 degrees difference between indoors and outdoors. Uh, and so, um, you know, that probably leads to uh, buildings being built a little bit tighter just um, out for comfort, for uh, what what is obvious to people even without making measurements. It's uh, it's interesting. Does that still continue? Is I mean, I'm, I know the state also had a... Uh, they were good about uh, incentivizing uh, weatherization work and energy efficiency. Am I right? Uh, I'm not sure how much is the state. Uh, all across the country, a lot of the um, money is federal. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the the low income weatherization programs were born out of LIHEAP, which be- began in the 70s. Are you familiar with that program? No, sir. So the uh, LIHEAP is the low income heating assistance program, 
And uh, back in the 1970s, there was, uh, you know, social programs decided that, um, you know, people at low, with low income were having trouble paying for heating bills. And we decided it was probably not a good thing for uh, low income people to, to freeze to death or have their pipes freeze. And so heating assistance began. And then sometime in the 80s, um, you know, regulators in that program decided, wait a minute, if the government is going to pay the heating bill, then uh, shouldn't we try to lower the heating bill and weatherize the house? And so that's where uh, low income weatherization programs began in the 1980s. And today there is federal money that goes to every county in the United States. Um, and part of what you see is probably because um, the low income heating assistance and therefore the weatherization dollars went um, uh, more uh, preferentially in the coldest climates uh, where the risk was greatest. So Chicago, Minneapolis, Detroit, um, and so forth. Um, but uh, that actually has shifted in recent years to where uh, we're actually concerned about people, uh, you know, facing the heat. And so weatherization dollars are actually getting shifted. Uh, Especially to old the, people. It's a huge concern, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 And so that's just been the evolution of the, um, uh, the weatherization industry. And there's a, an organization called CEE, the Center for Energy and Environment here in Minneapolis. And they've always been involved in both uh, research and weatherization. Uh, well, maybe not weatherization, but a lot of, a lot of research. Um, there's been, um, you know, there's been a, um, what's it called? A sound abatement program near the Minneapolis airport. Uh, it turns out that another thing that air tightness is important for is keeping your house quiet if you're near an airport. Um, so folks so, are trying to do like remediation for noise or are using blower doors to track down air leaks and consequently sound leaks. Yeah. I did yeah, not exactly. know that. Yeah. Cool. Um, so uh, CEE has done a lot of groundbreaking research. You know, I know, very, I know very recently they've been involved with what's the best way to test multifamily buildings. Um, you know, do you test each unit or do you test the whole building? Um, if it's a garden style apartment, as is common, you know, in the Pacific Northwest where all of the units open to outside, well, then how do you test the whole building? If that's what you're trying to accomplish, do you need, you know, 20 blower doors to test 20 units and, uh, or is there another way to do it? So that kind of research. Is there is another way to do it? Is it work to um, have a whole building tested at once? Uh, the research is ongoing, but it, it looks like you can get, I would not say an uh, precise measurement, but you can get some pretty good clues about what's going on if you test one unit in the middle and then measure what pressure is induced in the adjacent units um, that don't have a blower door in them. But have, so you what know. you're looking for is to see how connected they are, uh, it, it, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So like, like zonal pressure measurements, if you're familiar with that, you know, measuring the, the attic zone or the garage zone and see how how – much that's attached via airflow to the main part of the house. That's really interesting. So yeah. I'm guessing the greater enforcement of air tightness requirements nationwide through the IRC uh, and those uh, high performance building standards like Passive House and Energy Star have led to uh, increased demand for your products. Is that true? Yeah. Over the years, um, you know, growth has been, um, well, over the long term, it's been steady. Over short term, it's been very bumpy. Um, so, yes, more and more states adopt the IRC and are requiring blower door testing on new construction, but uh, enforcement is often um, hit and miss. And um, it also depends on whether a state is um, uh, writes their building codes uh, statewide or if it's jurisdiction by jurisdiction. And then if it is jurisdiction by jurisdiction, um, you know, what does each county or city adopt with the IRC. But generally the trend has definitely been uh, towards growth. Um, but it, it's been, it's been bumpy. <laughs> uh, so do you have any idea how many new homes are being air tightness tested now? You know, I, I really don't know. Um, the, the better question to ask that or a better organization to ask that question of would be ResNet who does HERS ratings. So many, but not all states that require blower door testing are using a HERS score, which um, quantifies how much more energy efficient a home is compared to a reference house. And uh, the ResNet organization writes the standard and collects all the data on buildings that are tested according to their standards. But I, I don't really know. 
I bet it's uh, just a small percentage, if I had to guess. Uh, you know, I would say less than 10. Uh, of new construction, I think it's quite high. Yeah. Um, in, in states that require, uh, that utilize the HERS score, I think it might be, you know, 80, 90% of new construction is blower door tested. But on, uh, you know, renovation projects or, um, you know, trying to improve existing building stock, yeah, it's, it's going to be quite low. Hmm. So the things you make, blower doors, manometers, flow hoods, are all indispensable for building diagnostics. And uh, they're also expensive, but I'm guessing that's largely because they have to work day in and day out for people who may be doing this do dozens of tests or uh, every day for years. Um, have you ever considered making like less expensive versions of the things you make for DIYers like myself? It's been tossed around the fine home building lunch table that, you know, uh, a sufficient fan could help you not necessarily quantify the leakage, but it could at least help you track down where leaks are. Yeah. So I thought the same thing when I joined the Energy Conservatory, because I do a lot of, you know, DIY work myself. And I thought, you know, boy, a lot of people are going to want to be able to do this. But, you know, it really hasn't gotten a lot of traction in discussions. We aren't hearing, you know, home centers contacting us saying, hey, we'd like to uh, make these available for rent, or can you make a cheaper version that we would use? And I think, you know, it might be because uh, the training required is a little more than um, than using a drill. It's yeah, more <laughs> more than using a drill for sure. Um, you know, the other thing that I would recommend for the DIY community is uh, look at your local power company and find out if they have um, uh, you know energy audits that they will do that include a blower door test. I know here locally in Minneapolis, our power company will send out the energy squad for a hundred dollars. And for $100, they will do a blower door with some thermography. Um, they will replace all your um, complex fluorescent or incandescent bulbs with LEDs. They'll replace the weather stripping on your doors um, and, uh, you know, just generally observe the insulation in your attic. And, I mean, they'll do a lot for 100 bucks. And so if you're in, uh, you know, DIY and you'd like to know where you stand or, um, where you could make improvements, see if your local power company has an energy audit program that they will do because it's often very cost effective. Um, and I don't think there's any reason that you couldn't have them come out for a hundred bucks. And then after you make your improvements, come out and measure it again. That's great advice. I'm going to have to remind our producer about this after the show. <laughs> we were yeah. talking about this ahead of recording. Um, I'm guessing the TEC maintains a customer service line. In fact, I know you do because I've heard people who have had good help from y'all. Uh, what are the, some of the common things people ask you about? Um, you know, some of the, the most common ones are, you know, is this working because I can't get up to 50 pascals or if I'm testing <laughs> ducts, I can't get up to 25 pascals. And what that means is it's way more leaky than you think. So people who begin making blower door measurements or measuring duct tightness um, are often shocked at how leaky existing buildings and existing duct work are. Uh, and so, you know, the reason you can't get it up to pressure is because even at the maximum output of our fans, um, you're only getting 10 pascals and not 50 because it's so very leaky. Um, and so, so how much CFM can one of your fans in the open fan position, the most volume of air move? Uh, the, the model three moves about 6,000 CFM. So, um, how I mean, many air changes would that be? You... <laughs> well, on a, on a typical size house, I'm thinking that's about 15 to 20 ACH 50. Yeah. So I'll, I'll explain that measurement for those that aren't familiar. Um, air tightness in the building codes is usually measured in air changes per hour at 50 pascals. So that means you take the volume of leakage that you measure at 50 and you divide it by the volume of the house, and that'll tell you how many times does the air in the house change over in an hour. So air changes per hour, hour ACH, 50. And uh, typical building codes in the north uh, require typically three air changes per hour or less. In the south, where the climate's not as harsh, they typically require five or maybe seven air changes per hour. But, you know, an old leaky home can be 15, even 20, ACH 50. 
And, uh, you know, that's where you're looking at maxing out the fan. <laughs> uh, you know, if you're going to push 6,000 CFM and you're still not going to get to 50. My guess is in a house that leaky, some of the leaks are obvious and presumably you would go in and fix those first and then retest and hopefully yeah. then you can get a real number. Yeah. Well, the nice thing is that um, even if you can't get to 50, as long as you can get to 10, the manometer will extrapolate what the leakage would be at 50 for you. So, you know, if you can get to 12 pascals, it's going to extrapolate, oh, this is 27,000 CFM 50, <laughs> even though the air or the fan can only move 6,000. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that at lower pressures, and I had to recently test a, a friend's house at higher pressures because it was so tight. Um, what error is introduced when you're not testing at 50 pascals? So it, it depends on how far you, away you are. So the, um, and I don't know how deep you want to get into the math. Oh, but, let's go. <laughs> okay. Let's, so uh, uh, the, the um, air leakage of a house tends to follow the power law, which means you have a number multiplied by the pressure and raised to a power. The power that it's raised to across the average of many buildings and homes tested is about 0.65, um, uh, which means it's, it's not a square root and it's not linear kind of in between. Um, and, uh, if you're, um, and that, but that exponent can be different. A tighter house tends to have an exponent higher than 0.65. A leaky one might have an exponent much closer to 0.5. And so depending on what the real exponent is compared to what we assume in our math is we assume 0.65, um, and how far away you are from 50, that will determine the error that actually uh, happens in your measurement. But generally, if you're between 40 and 60, you're going to be very close to um, what gets what uh, the actual CFM 50 is because we're extrapolating a fairly short distance. If you're only able to get to 12 pascals and you're in a leaky house where your exponent might really be 0.55 instead of 0.65 and you're extrapolating all the way to 50, you'll have more error. And is it likely to read artificially tight or artificially leaky if you're uh, at, a, at a low Pascal yeah. at a, in, a, in a leaky house? Uh, I would have to do the math. I, I can't work that out of my head off the top of my, um, off the top of my head. But, uh, you know, give me 15 minutes in a spreadsheet, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I might be the only person who wants to know this. I, I just, yeah. it's, it's, I'm curious because yeah. uh, I think part of the magic of the manometer is it, it can give you information even when the data is less than ideal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the objective. And frankly, when a house is that leaky, you're more interested in finding and fixing the leaks. Then do, do you really care if it's 15,000 or 17,000 CFM 50? Probably not. You want, you got big holes and you want to fix them. <laughs> do you know how many blower doors and manometers your company has out there presently? Um, so the biggest selling product, well, has been the DG 700. That's the uh, manometer that everybody knows and loves. And we've sold upwards of 40,000 of those over the years, 45,000, something like that. Um, the blower door fans tend to last longer than the manometers. And so uh, that's been in production longer, but still is maybe more like 25 or 30,000 fans, something like that. Yeah. What about the newest uh, manometer, the 1,000, the DG 1000? Um, I'm not... Uh, real sure on the numbers on that. Uh, I haven't looked at it recently, but it's in the, you know, several thousands for sure. We, that's been out since 2016. Are you supporting the DG 700 still? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we will make repairs as long as we can still get the parts. We can't get all the parts anymore, but if it's in good working order, you can certainly send it in. We'll do a full calibration on it. Uh, we even do calibrations on the DG3, which was the DG700's predecessor. Mm. Um, those are, you know, 20 plus years old, but we do a couple of calibrations on those every week, every month. And, uh, you know, typically find that they, you know, they, they do drift, but they're not, they're not way out. <laughs> uh, what, what products are you most proud of? What, what do you like to show people when, you know, you talk about your work? Um, it depends on who I'm talking to. If I'm talking to an HVAC person, walking them through the TrueFlow device, uh, this is the device that you put in place of the air filter in your furnace or in your um, air conditioner and measures the airflow and then also has an app that goes with it that tells you, okay, 
your airflow is way low and the problem is your return duct is too small or we found out that your evaporator coil is really restrictive so it must be must be dirty um, so that's the one you know I'm most proud of at the moment probably partly because it's our most recently released product um, uh, and uh, you know we've really tried to marry you know the technology and the app together with the devices make them easier to use and give people guidance if uh, if you're familiar with that product the previous generation of it um, measured airflow almost as accurately but you know, it was more of a, a nerd product because it would say, okay, you just measured 1,253 CFM through the furnace. But what does that mean? Well, <laughs> if you don't know what that means, then you need guidance. And so that's where we took this app and we went the next step and said, 1,253 is way too low for a four-ton air conditioner. And here's where you need to look for the problem. So uh, I should, I had someone from your company uh, show me this product that the recent uh Building Science Symposium, Southeast Building Science Symposium in Chattanooga, and it's quite a piece of impressive piece of kit. Uh, it, can you describe what it looks like? It, it's <laughs> it's hard to describe. Um, it's a plate with holes in it. Uh, <laughs> so um, it, it, so it, it's it's a plastic device that I've heard people say, "Oh, it looks cool. It's like Death Star looking." <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a, a plastic, um, plate that's uh, roughly 12 by 18 inches. Um, and it snaps into different adapters that are required because not everybody's furnace filter is the same size. So you put the, the measurement plate into this adapter and then, you know, there's a process that you get walked through in the app that tells you, okay, now remove your filter and put this device in. And then it measures the, the airflow and gives you guidance on, you know, what is your airflow? What are the pressures in your system and what does that mean? How do you, you know, how should you be adjusting that uh, to get optimal efficiency and optimal performance? It's pretty cool. I, uh, I only scratched the surface of all the things that you can do, but near as I could figure is you put in a bunch of parameters that describe the HVAC system and then it helps you figure out if it's going to work as intended and how you can make it better. Yeah, exactly. And this is really important, especially in humid parts of the country, you know, across the, the southeast part of the United States, um, because, uh, first of all, there aren't any other simple and accurate ways to measure airflow. It, it's just, you know, there's there's about 10 other ways and we train on uh, how you can do that, but none of them are simple and none of them are very accurate. And so making that measurement but the, but making the measurement is very important to the performance of the system. If you don't get the airflow dialed in to 350, 400, or 450, depending on the needs of the house and the climate it's in, then you're either going to sacrifice um, dehumidification performance or you're going to sacrifice efficiency. So when airflow is, is too high, then it will not do enough dehumidification, but the efficiency will be good. If airflow is too low, then you do maybe more dehumidification than you need, or maybe enough. Um, and but efficiency—that's always at the expense of efficiency. So if you're if you live in Louisiana, you're typically going to go for lower airflow and sacrifice the efficiency to get the dehumidification because um, you know you're trying to protect building materials and keep occupants comfortable. Your um, employee summed it up by saying you're trying to marry building science with HVAC uh, work, and I thought that was pretty. It sounded like it's something we need to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, you met with uh, Chris Hughes, um, and uh, Chris has been a, a great addition to our team. He comes from a background of HVAC. Uh, you know, he was uh, owned a company with his father in Louisiana for many years and decided he wanted to dig deeper in the building science, and he's come to work for us. And he had done blower door testing before, but he's really been instrumental in helping us marry the building science and the HVAC community together because an HVAC technician won't always know when the problem that they're really up against is that that finished room over the garage is super air leaky and it doesn't matter how much air they supply to it, they're not going to keep it comfortable. Or they may not know that um, the problem they're facing is that there's leakage from the supply duct into the attic and that's causing the whole house to be depressurized. And so, um, 
you know, that those kind of problems, unless you know a little bit about the building science, uh, you know, uh, you, you don't know where to go. Uh, you know, an HVAC technician will often get, um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of stories uh, about HVAC technicians getting frustrated and just writing a house up. That's just a problem house house. Don't go near it. You know, you know, you're going to get, we can't fix the, it. <laughs> we can't fix it. And the customer is never going to be happy. And, you know, so enter the the building science people that, that get involved and there's a, you know, a, a budding community around marrying the building science together with the HVAC performance that helps people solve these problem homes and find out what, what's really going on. But you've got to have the tools and you've got to be able to make the measurements before you can pinpoint something rather than just, uh, you know, throwing, oh, you should just spray foam the house. Like, well, wait a minute, that's a lot of money. Um, and you, do we no know that that's going to work, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can you can end up, uh, you know, spray foaming the ceiling from the attic and find out, oh, it was the crawl space that was leaky, <laughs> you know? It's funny, uh, Chris uh, and, and I were in this, you know, event hall and uh, the air conditioning system is dripping condensate, right, uh, uh, periodically. <laughs> And so we started talking about the things we notice in the build environment. What do you notice uh, when you're out and about looking at buildings? So I have a, a couple of hobbies. One of them is, uh, you know, when you walk into a restaurant and you notice that it's really hard to open the door uh, because the building is depressurized because they have this big commercial range hood and it's depressurizing the building so much that you can barely open the door. Or... On the other hand, they have a great big makeup air system that's pushing too much air back in, and now the door won't shut, and it blows open an inch. You know, <laughs> So those are telltale signs that the HVAC system in that restaurant <laughs> is not working properly. Uh, another one that's always been fun for me is looking at how, you know, if you go into a really old building that's been renovated and look at you know, how did they marry together the old um, structure with the new improvements and how did they tie the old plumbing to the new plumbing or how did they tie the old, um, you know, uh, you know, hundred year old trusses together with new framing members. Um, and you know, that's, I just love looking at that. My, my dad, uh, flipped houses for a while and he used to call it residential archeology, span you know, yeah. digging through the layers of construction as you deconstruct them and going, Oh, look, this used to be, you know, something else. <laughs> Uh, you find weird products that didn't catch on sometimes, right? That's kind of fun yeah. too. Do you have uh, like your own uh, interest in working on your own house? Do you do you like to work on your place? Oh yeah, I, I've I've done. Um, so when I was uh, seventeen in high school, my dad and I added on to the house I lived in, and that was sort of the beginning for me. And then just uh, in the last five years, I've uh, completed a, an addition onto my house. I've um, a house, original house is a 1958 ranch style house. That's about 2,300 square feet. And I added on almost a thousand. So, um, about 30% to the, um, to the size of the house. And, uh, that's been, uh, challenging and fun and exciting, um, to, uh, to see how much more comfortable the new part of the house is because it's, you know, super insulated walls and really, really good air tightness. And, you know, I, I built the, um, the ductwork that goes out into the new portion, you know, to accommodate what I figured would be the maximum. And I've had to set the balancing dampers down so that the runs into that new addition are only running about 20, 25% of the airflow that they, they could handle because they end up being way, way over conditioned if, <laughs> if I were to run all the airflow. Do you, do you, uh, do you, have you done much of the work on the, on your room addition? Yeah. Yeah. So this addition, I didn't do the concrete work in the foundation. I did not do the siding, but I did everything else. Cool. So framing, uh, roofing, electrical, plumbing, sheetrock, tile. Um, oh, I didn't lay the carpet. Um, but, uh, you know, the finished carpentry. Yeah. So it's, uh, been a lot of evenings and weekends. <laughs> Uh, is the family supportive of these endeavors? Uh, yeah, sometimes so supportive that I get signed up for other people's home improvements too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've come uh, to learn that a lot of engineers listen to the fine home building podcasts. Uh, yeah. Uh, what do you, what do you think's up there? What, uh, why? 
Well, I think, uh, you know, the engineering mindset says, uh, you know, this isn't too hard for me to figure out. If I just get some education, I can figure this out. And I think that's true for a lot of people. So I would say I'm experienced enough to know that um, you can figure out how to do it. But when you're doing something like, um, you know, sheetrock or tile, that requires a craftsman's hand. And a lot of engineers really don't have that. So, yeah, you can run the wiring, you can run the plumbing. That's, you know, nobody's going to see if that looks bad and it'll probably work fine. But, uh, you know, uh, you know, finish carpentry, tile work, uh, and like I said, uh, uh, mudding and taping sheetrock, that, that takes a little more experience and you, you got to have a, a knack for that. Tons of hours of practice, right? It's just like... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, back to uh, helping other people uh, with their home improvements. I, I figured out that over the last three years between friends and, you know, kids and family members that I have installed eight toilets in the last three years. <laughs> <laughs> you're a good friend <laughs> yeah, you. apparently or a sucker i'm not sure which <laughs> so do you want to share the uh, ach uh, 50 numbers from your house for our excellence and air tightness award uh, board sure uh my house is 3.3 ach 50 that's after the addition and i actually think that after i added 30 percent to the square footage i think the ach 50 well the ach 50 for sure went down but I think the total leakage also went down. Because that one wall it's attached to got air sealed, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The one wall it's attached to got, got all sealed up. And the, you know, the, uh, the three new walls are more airtight than the one that it covered up. I think three is pretty respectable from a house built in the 50s. Yeah. That's not what yeah, they were worried is. about then. I think you'd agree. No. Yeah, no, that's, that's not what they were worried about. Um, you know, I kind of know where the big problems are, but I had, you know, I had new siding done and they put Tyvek on and taped some stuff up and that helped with the air tightness. And, um, you know, my big problem now is the, uh, the ceiling. Um, so I got to get up in the attic and do some air sealing. That's fun work. You're going to love it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Have respirator. We'll travel. Yeah. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Steve. Like it was the last time we had a chance to talk. Uh, is there anything like you'd like to tell our or ask our audience before we go? Um, not that I can think of. Um, just like to let you know if you are interested in, in building science, want to learn more about blower door testing, reach out to us at energyconservatory.com. Uh, we have a great reputation for customer service. Like you said, we've got people that answer the phone right away, can answer your questions. If they're not available, they'll call you back. Um, you know, that's our, our reputation and um, it's well earned and um, look us up. Thanks, Steve. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Patrick. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks, Steve Rogers, for joining us, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks very much for listening. Do an air tightness test. <laughs>